Good evening and thank you for joining us for this special look back at 2023 here on WTOL 11. I'm Melissa Andrews. As we move on to 2024, we want to highlight some of our favorite stories from our community from the past year. We start with Spirit Week at Woodmore High School and this year's celebration focused on making sure every student in the building felt like part of the student body. John Monk has more. It's pretty common to hear a loud crowd inside of the gym at Woodmore High School on Fridays. But these students weren't rooting for their basketball or volleyball teams, but rather a group of students with special needs playing a game of kickball. We're not judging them or nothing. We're being patient. we encouraging them to do their best. Students with special needs were partnered with other students and gave it their all on the court with cheerleaders and fans making it an authentic sporting event experience. The goal was to give this group of students who tend to be isolated from the rest of the student body a chance to see that they are a part of their school community. Because, you know, they're, uh, they have feelings too, so, you know, I, if I was in their situation, I would, you know, want to be talked to and stuff like that. The game capped off the high school's Disability Awareness Month Spirit Week, an initiative proposed by the Woodmore National Honor Society to give these students a chance to shine and show everyone that inclusion is a core part of this student body. Showing them that there's nothing to be afraid of, that just because they're a little different doesn't mean that they are not able to do some of the things that we are able to do. Mm -hmm. um, they're capable of making friends. They're capable of being involved. Now Spirit Week will actually be wrapping up this Sunday where the National Honor Society here will be hosting a three versus three basketball tournament with proceeds benefiting the local Christie's Corner restaurant that employs people with special needs and disabilities. Reporting from Woodmore High School, I'm John Monk, WTOL 11. Chances are, if you live in central Toledo near Indiana Avenue, you've been smelling barbecue for 60 years. Well, that's because the longest running black owned restaurant in Toledo has been feeding the community since the 1960s. Back in July, Maya May took us inside as the city honored its legacy. In 1963, Joan and Samuel Stewart established Ann's Barbecue, and this month, Toledo City Council honored the business, which will now hold the title as oldest black-owned Toledo restaurant. The Stewart's grandson now runs the barbecue carryout and says this year he has fully recognized his family's impact on Toledo. When I was younger, it just was my family restaurant, you know, but as I've gotten a little bit older, it's starting to dawn on me exactly how important to the community it is. And the same customers there from day one say their families remain grateful for food and the generosity. Robert Savage helps run the kitchen for the poor on Vance Street. He says those who give need a community they can count on in times of need. Sammy Stewart, the original owner, was a very good guy. Him and my father were very close. And uh, my father would run short of money. He could come over here and get it for Sammy. He would make sure he got it. And uh, good people. For 60 years, 90% of Ann's Barbecue's menu has remained the same. Ribs, rib tips, and polar sausage. They say now no one gets turned away. And, and they keep it, you know, in the neighborhood, you know, so that people can come here and get what they want, you know. Samuel Stewart and his wife Ann adopted their grandson before his fifth birthday. Today, Samuel Stewart Jr. has adopted the restaurant, in honor of a legacy he now hopes to carry on. Because it's tough. Sometimes you're looking at a 100 degree temperature in here when it's 95 outside. So, yep, and that's all I honor to him and uh, his legacy and the hard work that he put in to make sure we had something for future generations. Reporting in Central Toledo, Maya May for WTOL 11. Every year, WTOL 11 is proud to partner with the Victory Center for its annual Over the Edge fundraiser. The event allows people to face their fears while raising money to support those who are battling theirs each and every day. This year, Amanda Fay showed us how the Victory Center made all the difference for a local woman who fought to the end of her young life. I had a huge crush on her freshman year of high school, but she was unavailable. 
But as fate would have it, Daniel Forney and Megan Orsakowski would find their way back to each other in college, soulmates. I had planned on proposing in the fall, but that uh, was quickly sped up. Quickly sped up as Megan was diagnosed with breast cancer again. She was diagnosed with cancer the same week the lockdowns started in 2020. Um, and then she was in the clear the following year. Um, and then this past summer it came back and it had spread aggressively. Megan, in her own words, said over the edge for victory in August of 2021. I was diagnosed with stage three triple negative breast cancer, which is considered one of the most aggressive breast cancers because there aren't that many treatment options out there. Um, and so I started treatment during COVID. You'll notice Megan's pink tutu as she rappelled down a 16 story building in downtown Toledo, all to raise money for the Victory Center, which provides a variety of free services to local like cancer that. patients. Megan was set to go over the edge again in September of 2022, a few weeks after she and Daniel were set to be married. We planned the wedding for August 20th. There was a rapid decline from radiation and the spread. And so on August 7th, we said it to each other and that's what I consider our wedding. Unfortunately, we never actually got a real wedding. The couple would be married 30 hours before the 25 year old teacher would die. And now, in her honor, Daniel will be repelling Friday along with Megan's brother and two of her best friends. It's scary, but we think about her the whole time. She loved it. She was terrified of doing it, but she did it and it was the best thing she's ever done, she said. Before cancer, this was something I would never have done. I am terrified of heights. A message to live life to its fullest while supporting worthwhile causes. For WTOL 11, I'm Amanda Fay. Still ahead, four inspiring trips for local veterans, and WTOL 11 goes along for the ride. Welcome back. 2023 was a big year for Flag City Honor Flight. The organization arranged four different flights, giving dozens of local veterans the chance to visit war memorials in Washington, D.C. and get a welcome home many of them missed out on when they served our country. Dan Cummins was along for each of those flights. Here's a look back at the trip they took in September in a story put together by photojournalist Paul Kwapik. So Lord, I just pray over a blessing over this flight and everybody who's going on it, everybody who's put in the hard work to make it happen. Lord, I just pray this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. It's just an honor. It's just such a great feeling seeing all these veterans come together and get on the plane. Yeah, every single one of these guys here today made a sacrifice. And being part of this, I just want to make these guys feel like they feel appreciated for the sacrifice that they made and get the welcome home that they deserve but didn't get 50 to 60 years ago. first opportunity uh, to attend uh, all these uh, memorials with other veterans. Uh, it's, it's tough. It's, it's just seeing the names up there and that many people dying in the war. It's just, I'm glad they built the wall. I mean, it's really, it's really a good place to go to honor the people that passed away for the war, for the battles. I can't believe I've waited a long, long time to come here and uh, just when I get closer to the Vietnam, it's when it's going to get tough. Dan, this is the closure we never really got. Nobody said welcome home, and uh, this really means a lot. So far, it's been just very overwhelming, um, very emotional. Honor all the people that are here, and just prepare myself to go to the wall has been very hard for me. What would you say to your brother if you could say something to him? I love him. I wish he was here to be with me. And every day that goes by, I think about him and I worry about him even where he's at. I still worry about him, so 
He, he was a great brother and did taught me a lot. So, and uh, we are uh, gonna meet someday again. It's my way of giving back knowing that I'm making a difference with a veteran for the day that I'm, I spend with them and you know and hopefully you know as these younger generations come up um, they'll be able to pay that forward to other veterans like myself because I'll eventually be in those shoes. It's just amazing to be here with all the other veterans. I've had a great time talking to them and hearing their stories and on the plane it's all chatter 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 but um, it just seems like a lifetime ago that I was there. I think it seems like everywhere we go, there's people there to welcome us, to shake our hands, to say thank you for your service, and it really makes you feel good as a veteran to have that. But nowadays, it's a lot nicer. People are thanking you. If I wear my Vietnam hat, people come up and say thank you, which is really appreciated. I really like that. Show respect for our military, and it gives me a good feeling being a vet. Uh, most of these guys are Vietnam vets, and, and uh, we never got to welcome home. And the uh, same way the Korean War guys, the kind of forgotten war, and show respect for them. Oh, it's unbelievable what it means to, to see the smiles on their face and, and the trip they get to make. And it's really special when they come back home after a great day out at D.C. Tell them that uh, they are appreciated, they are remembered, and they do mean something. You know, they, they are important. They, they have not been forgotten. I love being around these veterans, looking at the brotherhood, it's real evident. Um, I mean, think that's, that's what's real, real. These men had served and some had given everything and they're here and they're celebrating their welcome home and honoring these guys, it's just terrific. I couldn't believe it, especially my daughter and granddaughter came up from Cincinnati, son-in-law. Uh, family from Bucyrus, totally amazed, totally shocked, uh, totally different from 50 some years ago. Yeah. Welcome home. Thank you, Dan, thank you. This is great. I didn't think everybody would stay this long, but here they are. They never left. So for all of our veterans, the one thing we want to make sure to say is thank you, thank you, thank you from Flag City Honor Flight. Wow, so many beautiful stories we've done this year. Still ahead, people right here in our area raising awareness about medical needs and procedures. Welcome back. Did you know there was such a thing as Feeding Tube Awareness Week? Well, it's meant to bring attention to a device that helps people suffering from hundreds of illnesses where they can't eat solid food. Michael Sandlin talked to a family in February whose youngest one needed it and what they say are the blessings and the setbacks. Aria Ruffin is just like any other one-year-old. She's full of energy, <laughs> has an infectious baby smile, and she's already turning into a daddy's girl. A pretty baby. But there's one major difference. She has short bowel syndrome or short gut. Short gut is when you're missing a lot of your small intestine. Um, like she only has two centimeters left. Before Aria was born, an obstruction was seen in her bowels, and immediately after her birth, a large portion of her intestines had to be removed. Since then, Aria hasn't had a single bite of solid food, so instead, she relies on a feeding tube. She gets three mouths through her feeding tube an hour, um, she doesn't get anything by mouth. While this liquid diet is able to give her all of her nutrients, Arya's life still comes with many challenges. Her mobility is limited by the very thing that keeps her alive, and it doesn't do anything to help with the side effects of short gut. In fact, Arya spent her first birthday in the hospital. It's been rough. It's been real rough. Um, it's, I mean, it's ups and downs. She's a fighter, so sometimes you can't even tell that something's wrong with her because she's always smiling or she just relaxed, like even when she's, you know. Super sick. Yeah, super <laughs> sick. 
But without the feeding tube, Dr. Holly Bryan with Toledo's NICU says it's likely baby Aria wouldn't still be here. Really, it is a life-saving technology that allows us to be able to have people who would not be able to take in enough nutrition be able to um, not only survive, but be able to thrive. Thrive in part because how much things have changed in recent years. Well, thankfully, the um, technology is great. We've been able to get it to be pretty um, easily hidden under clothing. It's a reality that doesn't escape Aria's parents, but most kids are able to eventually outgrow the need for a feeding tube. However, Aria is likely to have a feeding tube indefinitely. Uh, the doctors did say that it's probably going to be for the rest of her life. So now they're coming to terms with this being her reality permanently. And while Aria's parents say it might slightly slow her down compared to other kids her age, they believe the family environment they've created will make sure she's never left behind. It, with her siblings being able um, to help and being older than her, that is going to kind of speed up that process for her because she actually has other kids around, so she's going to want to try things and do things on her own anyway. For WTOY 11, I'm Michael Sandlin. A woman who received an organ donation is doing things she couldn't do just a couple of years ago, and it's thanks to someone she'll never get to meet. But she was able to thank the people who knew her donor the best for the tremendous gift of life. Amanda Fay was there for this story we brought to you back in July. Super mom, loved to be outside. She would run every day, um, work out every day. So when 35-year-old Allie Held Herman suddenly died from a brain aneurysm two years ago, it was a shock to say the least. But her family knew something good could come from tragedy. The mother of three young children would live on as an organ donor. Initially, I was okay. I was happy with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm an organ donor as well. Mm -hmm. And so we understood, but to see what it's become, you know, how much good there is out of it. Yeah. Allie would save five lives through organ donation and touch dozens more. We got a letter in the mail last week or the week before for bone grafts, tissues, her eyes, her corneas, plus all the major organs is probably 50 at least. And one of them they'd get to meet, the woman who holds Allie's heart. Look at you. <laughs> Beth Winhusen of Cincinnati. I'm overwhelmed, beyond blessed. Um, we have loved them before we've met them. Gathered at Mercy Health St. V's, the place where they said goodbye to her, Allie's husband, children, parents, and other close relatives and friends would take turns with the stethoscope, listening to their loved one's heart beat on during a rare meeting between organ donor and recipient families. Life Connection of Ohio provides ongoing support and helped facilitate the meeting. I just, I just felt that it was the presence of Allie work, walking in with her, you know, and just so grateful, the gratitude that she gave us, you know, and, and feeling so sad that we lost her, but just seeing that gift going on is just, there's just no words. A number of years ago, Beth's heart became damaged when she got an infection during a hospital stay. About three years ago, she'd learned there was nothing else the doctors could do. She'd need a new heart, and she got a really healthy one. Oh, I've been told it is so healthy, and because she was so athletic and took such good care of herself. Now, Beth enjoys hiking in the woods with her husband and doesn't take a single day for granted. No, every day is a gift um, from God and in this new heart that I have, um, just every sunrise, every sunset, every moment that I walk, that I breathe, I, I, all I can do is cry and say thank you. <laughs> Reporting in Central Toledo, Amanda Fay, WTOL 11. Allie really is a hero. We'll be right back with a look at some members of Northwest Ohio's future. Welcome back. We are wrapping up our look back at the past year. Kaylee Kirby introduces us to Springfield's top 10 who are doing something that hasn't been done in more than 20 years. I'm going to the University of Toledo for civil engineering. I'm going to Ohio State to major in education. Meet Ava Ball and Jewel Horak, the valedictorian and salutatorian at Springfield High School. 
but let me introduce you to a few more of this year's graduates. Isabella Bullback will be going to PGSU, Eliza Smith at Eastern Michigan, and Kayla Dixon is heading to Kent State. Are you noticing a theme here? These are the top 10 of the graduating class for Springfield High School. And yes, they're all girls. It's amazing because you're dealing with talented kids every single day. And so you're so lucky to be in this career. Obviously, every job has some hard days, but every time I get to work with kids like this, it's incredible. What they've done is a record of sorts. Having an all-female top 10 hasn't happened in more than two decades, if ever. But they'll tell you it's just a normal day. It's pretty awesome when you think about it, but at the end of the day, for all of us, it hasn't, like, this was our standard. We set ourselves at this standard and we expected it. They will be the next engineers, accountants, psychologists, and educators. Some of them have plans to double major, and all of them already have college credit, enough to be considered sophomores. Feels great to have all this uh, free college done. I feel prepared. I feel ready to take on college and it's really nice. Um, I have two other sisters so my parents have worked really hard to get us all through college. But the road hasn't been easy. They were freshmen at the height of COVID, dealing with hybrid learning, masks and everything else in between. They say the teachers and other staff have played a big role in their success. I want to be somebody like that for somebody else, another kid who uh, is maybe struggling in the school system, um, maybe is starting to like slip through the cracks, doesn't really know how to navigate it. Nine of the top 10 have been at Springfield for their entire education, and the principal says all of them are driven, both in the classroom and outside. Whether it be on a sport field, on a drama show, whether it be in the band, whether it be NHS or Students in Action, so much leadership. It is just an awesome feeling knowing that these kids are going to take care of us someday as an older generation. The future's in good hands. Although they are the top 10, it's never been a competition. They're all friends and support each other. At the end of the day, we'll always bleed blue. We love Springfield and here that's what matters. We're a community and we're a family. Reporting in Holland, Kaylee Kirby, WTOL 11. Thank you for joining us for this special look back at some of our favorite stories from the past year. Happy New Year from everyone at WTOL.